My dad recently passed away, and one of my tasks was to tidy up his study, back up his still running computer, and shut it down. Um, he's a retired psychologist, and he had thrown himself into writing a book about the impact of language into our lives, um, in particular how it can affect our thoughts, actions, and relationships. And in one chapter, he explores the fact that we quite often um, use words that can have very different meaning to different people. Uh, pretty versus ugly, success versus failure, integration versus separation. One person's success might look very different from another person's idea of what success is. So the meaning of words of sometimes very subjective. That made me think of the terminology and the language and concepts we use in health in New Zealand to describe influence and change our healthcare system. The language and words are often quite vague and the interpretation quite subjective at times. Then considerable time, effort and resource are used in an attempt to bring those concepts actually into life. I started to scribble some words of these concepts down on a piece of paper and uh, in the end actually got myself a buzzword bingo <laughs> framework. And a lot of those concepts you would have come across, a lot of those concepts you've seen and heard being thrown around and literally becoming buzzwords, they tend to lose their actual meaning. Um, I'm sure you can think of others. Um, HBL might fit nicely into one of those little squares. So from bingo to jigsaw puzzles. There are many ways to put together a jigsaw puzzle, but the result in the end should actually look the same. You have a reference picture to look at, to guide you, and actually in the end to confirm that you've completed it correctly. I started wondering where, where is that picture for healthcare in New Zealand? Um, who, who actually has it if there is one? And if there is one, can we perhaps have another look at it? Um, Yogi Berra, a famous now retired USA baseball player, said, if you don't know where you're going, you might end up someplace else. Um, I have a nagging feeling that parts of our healthcare system, in fact, might be heading someplace else. Um, district health boards interpret concepts and implement them. Most of the time they appear to be doing so without a clear reference picture, which makes me wonder, how do they actually know that they've completed the jigsaw puzzle correctly? Um, as I mentioned, these, these concepts have an impact on resource, time, and they also increase the scope of our day-to-day -day work and what's expected of us. Um, the relationship between time, scope, and resource, and quality is actually very, very well known and well described. And I would like in health to throw safety and quality in as well. The relationship is captured in this, what's called the triple constraint, or the iron triangle. And this is really widely accepted and pretty self-explanatory. If you need to complete a project in a shorter time frame, you have to either increase the resources that you have available to you, or you need to reduce the scope. You can't fiddle around and change one without the other. Um, if you widen the scope, you're gonna either need more time to complete the task, or you're gonna need more resource, or you're gonna need more time and resource. Um, I want to have a look at a bit of a closer look at the drivers in health that sits in those three corners of the triangle. And you'll all be very familiar with them. Six hour ED target, FSAs, waiting times. We've gone past the six months, we had five months, and if I remember, we're heading to four months next year. Reduced length of stay elective surgery target, numbers against time. 
So there's certainly quite a lot of pressure, and this is just sort of off the top of my head stuff. If we look at resource, live within our means, work differently. Now, I think I need to translate work differently. What that means is you have to work differently. There's no money. There's no more people. And you just have to work smarter, not harder. Um, cost neutral. Break even budget. Administration. Um, support FTE cap. All those things are very strict on resource. There ain't nothing more coming. Increasing our scope. Better, sooner, more convenient. Move upstream. In other words, secondary care, you need to get out there and um, support and help primary care. Influence the social determinants of health. Reduce ambulatory sensitive hospitalization rates. In other words, hospitalization or sen ambulatory sensitive hospitalization rates is patients that shouldn't end up in hospital because their care should happen in the community. Um, so the expectation is for us to influence it out there. Um, and we obviously now, the new buzzword, continuum of care, we need to participate and become part of the continuum of care and hold hands with um, primary care. And I've got no problem with all of these, but if you put it into the triangle, then it does become problematic because we're getting squeezed from all sides. Quality and safety sits in the middle of the triangle. So we've got a clear agreement in our in Good Hands document in Time for Quality that quality must be at the top of each agenda. Is it really, or is it actually taking a far distant second place to the dollar being discussed? So as I said, the pressure is being applied on all sides of this triangle. And I think the hope is, or the thought is, that by doing so, it will increase our efficiency and our effectiveness. I'm, I'm not so sure about that, to be honest. Up to a point, the healthcare system can actually reduce waste and become more efficient. But then something will have to start to give. And that something is what's sitting in the middle of the triangle. Quality and safety is going to start to um, become a problem. The other way that I think the healthcare system is trying to cope at the moment is actually to let fewer patients into the system. In other words, you know, if the hand basin is full, you better turn off the tap, otherwise it's going to overflow. Um, there's also, I think, a degree of changing the scope. Instead of doing big complicated cases, you can do a lot of smaller cases, and you actually change the scope of what you do from day to day. The question that I have is when do we actually reach the point where things actually start to fall apart? It's act as you can imagine, it's actually quite difficult to determine. Um, healthcare systems and healthcare delivery is complex. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't follow a nice sort of domino effect where the first domino falls in, and you can predict which domino is going to fall next. It's much more of a butterfly effect where you fiddle with something way over here and suddenly, very unexpectedly, something over there goes horribly wrong. And we, we've, we coined that sort of thing, we call it you know, unintended consequences. And there's a lot of unintended consequences happening around healthcare. I'm not saying we shouldn't try and improve the healthcare system. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite. But I think we need to tread very carefully. The last thing we want is to generate unintended consequences. Um, these can have significant negative impact. And I think it's even more likely to happen if there's lots of carrots and sticks that goes with change or trying to force change. Um, this can lead to gaming of the system. Um, it can certainly. Um, perhaps lead to ignoring what's really happening on the ground or just not reporting what's happening on the ground so that in the end you either avoid the stick or you get awarded the carrot. This obviously contribute or can contribute to creation of the mid staffordshire type environment 
where that can repeat itself again, and certainly that's not something we would like to see happen. So are there any early warning signs that things are starting to unravel? Well, there, if you look at the recent report from the Health Quality and Safety Commission, that obviously showed that the number of serious adverse events has gone up yet again. And since 2007, it's actually doubled. Now, this, this, this has been explained and attributed to better um, health sector reporting. And while that might be the case, I think it is a space we need to watch very closely. A recent article in the New Zealand Medical Journal, there were two DHBs that were audited. And in those two DHBs, 36% of patients needing hip and knee replacement were turned away and not getting their knees and hips replaced. And this was due to budget restrictions. It was also obviously impacted on by meeting the time, the waiting time targets. So this, this adds further weight, that publication, on the increasing concern and evidence we have of the growing unmet health need in New Zealand. Things are actually starting to unravel. We must further also be very careful of what we measure and what message our measurement actually gives. Um, we start to measure um, time. I previously mentioned the uh, six hour ED time measure. This, this can give you the, the message that the rest of what happens in ED is not as important as time. We're not measuring quality and safety. We're not measuring compassion. Um, and then by doing that, you can, as I said, give the wrong message and that can lead to unattended consequences again. So is putting pressure on all three aspects of the iron triangle a method of driving disruptive innovation? And people that were at the boat shed last night would realize that disruptive innovation doesn't work like that. You don't try and break something and then wait for people to innovate. So I feel it's actually time to change the triangle. I'm very proud to be working in New Zealand and in the public health care system. As a lot of you will agree, I think it's one of the best systems in the world. The New Zealand public actually seemed to support this. There was a recent article in the New Zealand Herald uh, by Brian Gaynor, I don't know if you guys have read it. He explored the difference in private health insurance coverage between New Zealand and Australia. In it he states, but the most frightening statistic is that only 12.5% of New Zealanders aged 65 and over are covered by health insurance compared with 52% across the Tasman. Now, to me, that's not frightening at all. I think that's actually quite reassuring that our 65-year um, and over population actually entrust their health to the public health care system. That does not mean, however, that we can pat ourselves on the back and sit back and relax. We have an obligation to continue to improve our system, to modernize it, and to innovate. But surely there's alternate ways to achieve this than trying the top-down squeeze that we're experience, experiencing at the moment on that uh, iron triangle. I recently attended the APAC meeting 2014, and uh, David is here. Highly recommended. There's one again uh, in 2015. Uh, this year's was held in Melbourne. In, in her key note address, Maureen Bissinagu, I think I say that right, um, that's her there, made a, had a very strong message of what positive impact a joyful workforce can have on healthcare delivery. And if you go to the entrance of the uh, Institute of Healthcare Improvement in the USA, you'll actually be met by that message at the entrance. We will improve the lives of patients 
the health of communities, and the joy of the healthcare workforce. Now that is, I've, I've felt that extremely strong, that the joy of the healthcare workforce is right up there in what they want to achieve. So actually a new triangle started to take shape in my mind. Maybe our triangle should change from the iron triangle to something that looks more along those lines where the joyful workforce, clinical leadership and compassionate care make up the three corners with efficient, effective and appropriate service sitting in the centre. Um, Maureen asked a few show of hand questions and I actually want to do the same so if you guys will humour me and participate please. Um, she asked, in the past week, have you, have you skipped a meal due to work? Right. Eat on the run. Yeah. Worked a full shift without a break. And that's going to become even worse now with the new legislation. Arrived home, work, yeah. <laughs> it's not a good picture from the top here. Change family or private plans due to work. Yeah. Drank too much coffee, tea, whatever energy drink is your poison. <laughs> Slept less than five hours a night. Yeah. You guys must be very happy. <laughs> I would actually like to add to the question she asked, two of my own questions. Has human resources made your life easier? <laughs> There's one hand. <laughs> Any jobs at your DHB going? <laughs> um, have you actually left work feeling positive about the day you've had? Well, that's much better. Good. So there's, there's some resilience left in the workforce. Um, thoughts and questions that are not asked at all, or not often enough. Are you happy in your job? Are you okay? You look tired, take a break. Thank you. Is there something I can do to help? Great job, well done. And then there's the odd DHB where, isn't it time for you to take your sabbatical? It's not heard in the corridors too often. So more seriously, who actually has or takes responsibility to encourage and promote a joyful workforce? Do we have a measure of performance for that? Is there a target? Um, this is an important part of the healthcare system and part of the workforce, and yet it's largely ignored. I want to have a bit of a closer look at the different aspects of the triangles. So compassionate care, I touched upon it at, at last year's conference, and this year's conference um, we've got some excellent speakers that can, that's going to talk on the topic of compassionate care, resilience, and burnout. Um, has the public opinion or perception of compassionate care and health care changed over the years? It's actually, as you can imagine, quite difficult to determine that. Um, I recently came across two paintings, however, that depicted doctors in their work environment. The first is a well-known painting. Uh, called the doctor. In 1887, the doctor could offer not much more than compassion to the dying child, and in doing so, the doctor actually inspired this painting. Um, if you go and read up on this, it's actually quite a moving story behind the painting. The second painting was commissioned in 2002. It's entitled The Three Oncologists. It actually, depicts, <laughs> it actually depicts professors in the departments of surgery and molecular oncology at Ninewells Hospital in Scotland in Dundee. And the artists actually spend a significant amount of time with these clinicians to get a feel for what their daily work life and challenges are. Now, if you look at, if you look at the painting, you can see their faces are quite gaunt and they actually look tired. There's no patient in the picture and um, all three of them seem to have been interrupted in their clinical duties, still gloved up with some what looks like fresh blood on the gloves. 
Their clinical skill and knowledge make it possible for patients to receive individualized care. It's difficult to judge from the painting whether compassion is one of those things they offer. But it is very difficult to offer compassion if you yourself are const constantly tired, rushed, and pressurized for time. Doctors need time to spend with their patients to ask what matters to you instead of what is the matter with you. Distributive clinical leadership. Now this is, this is something that everybody agrees on in, in healthcare in New Zealand, in, not just in New Zealand, in the world. Um, this goes from current and previous Minister of Health, all of us clinicians. We do have a reference document for it in good hands. And yet after five years, in good hands document saw the light in 2009. And after five years, if, if you go around the country, there's various degrees of implementation of distributive clinical leadership. Without it, we are not gonna innovate, improve, and modernize the healthcare system to the degree that we actually should or can. This is something that we are looking at urgently again as the ASMS, and it was quite encouraging to hear that the uh, um, health minister, Jonathan Coleman, actually mentioned it very early on after taking office that he's serious about clinical leadership as well. Moving to the center of the triangle, effective, efficient, and appropriate health care. We know that our public health system is actually effective and efficient, but I'm starting to question whether we're still appropriate. There's, we're slowly starting maybe to fall behind the eight ball. I don't know if you've seen in countries like Canada and USA, they introducing, rolling out, and promoting the Choose Wisely program, where you have, you have time to sit down and talk to your patient about what is the best evidence for intervention for laboratory tests and you actually make an informed evidence-based decision on where to go with care. This includes pack, you know, patient information packages and the actual guidelines are drawn up by the various colleges. Um, again, um, there is a link um, in the specialist that you hopefully, well, the electronic specialist to click on and go and have a look at the Choose Wisely program. The other area where appropriateness of care is gonna become increasingly important and increasingly difficult is conversations around um, end of life care and um, frailty care. Um, Tim, Tim drew us a very stark graph yesterday during our executive meeting. This, this is a huge area of challenge that's lying ahead for us. And to do this well, we are going to need time with our patients to sit down, have the conversation with the patient, with the family, and come to a compassionate um, decision. In conclusions, don't get me wrong, as I said, we have a very good public health care system, but we should continue to modernize it, we should continue to innovate, and we should continue to improve it. I've obviously made some very broad, generalized statements. The truth, and probably the saddest part to me, is that there are very good examples across the country where DHBs, managers, clinicians, clinical networks, departments, have actually done some very, very good work. The sad part is it doesn't spread across the country rapidly. It gets stuck there. We don't know about it. It's not publicized. We actually need to have a concerted effort to actually go and find the positive deviants and see how they've done it and replicate that across other DHBs and other departments. Our jobs are intellectually challenging, physically demanding. We are faced with constant change and pressure to stay within budget and to do more with relatively less. This can lead to fatigue, compassion fatigue, burnout, and a less effective, more prone to mistakes workforce. This is not an environment that promotes joy in the workforce. When we look after our healthcare workforce, optimize the work environment, and make sure we achieve and maintain joy in our workforce, 
Clinical leadership obviously has a major part to play in that and to achieve that. Investing money in healthcare and the health of New Zealand population is not money wasted. Martin McKee made that point very clear during his visit as well. Our patients and we should expect a safe and high quality health service delivered by compassionate staff in a friendly environment. Um, my DHB recently, I don't know if the other DHBs had the same program, I suspect that happened. They had an interactive display during Patient Safety Week. You could pop your head in there and take pictures of each other. But also what was interesting is they put that up and they left post-it notes for the public to write down what they thought would improve safety in the hospital. And I actually went and took a few pictures. Be positive. Put a smile on your face. Hey, you, smile. <laughs> And then I love this one. You give attitude, you receive attitude. <laughs> so you know what? I agree with what the public thinks. Joy and a smile on your face actually makes hospitals a safer place. I think it's time that we actually change the triangle. Thank you very much.